Um, and welcome, and thank you for joining our October 1st Tuesday. Um, my name is Daniel Center, and I'm the Community Conservation Coordinator for the Met Howe Conservancy. I would like to start this evening off with an acknowledgement and an introduction. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that the Met Howe Conservancy, as a land trust and environmental organization, seeks to protect and steward the land that for time immemorial was cared for by members of the Medhau tribe. This is their homeland. We recognize we must do more to build better relationships and acknowledge our past with our Medhau tribe descendants who still live and care for the land in this valley. Now, it was mid-August of this year on a lucky weekend day when the smoke was blowing in the right direction that I was sitting on the shore of Whitefish Island looking up the Medhau River. I noticed off in the distance, something with a long, flexible neck, a small head, a big bill that bent downward, and a brilliant reddish pink coloration. As this strange creature effortlessly made its way closer to me, I thought for a second I might be hallucinating because I was pretty sure that I was seeing a flamingo in the middle of the Methow River. A couple seconds later, as my brain picked up more pieces of the picture, did I realize what I was seeing. It turned out to be an inner tube in the shape of a flamingo carrying a man in his mid forties who was blasting a Morgan Wallen song and who had a whole separate tube just for his cold beverages. We exchanged friendly nods as the carefree flamingo carried on down river. While sightings like this may be the closest the Methow ever gets to seeing a flamingo in the wild. And doesn't mean that this group of species that we should never think about. In fact, soon many of us will make important financial decisions that will have a direct impact on these highly specialized and adapted birds and the sailing lakes ecosystems that they require. To tell us about these very real flamingos and their changing world is University of South Carolina Assistant Professor of Biological Sciences and my older brother, Dr. Nate Center. Welcome, Nate. Thank you very much. That is, uh, I'm actually almost speechless. That's quite an introduction. I, I, uh, I've never been, you know, linked in with an inner tube before. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I worked, I worked pretty hard on that intro. So I appreciate it, little brother. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much for, for joining in tonight. Um, as Daniel mentioned, um, I'm at the University of South Carolina in the Department of Biological Sciences, but my research program spans <laughs> that are basically found uh, all across the globe. And tonight I'm going to be talking to you about flamingos and more generally though, saline lakes and what I think saline lakes may tell us about the limits of sustainability. But before I get to those species and saline lakes and the heavy message that they might tell us. I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about myself. So in addition to being related to Daniel, I have been inculcated into the world of birds and biology from a very young age. Spent much of my first eight years at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, pictured here on the right. And as you can see on the left, I was an early convert to uh, watching hawks and other raptors as they migrated. Although if you stare particularly closely at that photo, you'll notice that I was staring through those binoculars backwards. So I definitely had some things to learn before I could actually move on to becoming a biologist. But eventually that is what I tried to do. And that really took off when my family moved to Alaska where I spent my teenage years and was given a shove off to spend those teenage years working with biologists all across the state. And those experiences really gave me a sense of wild places, but also helped me to transition from being someone interested merely in birds to being someone who was interested in asking questions and learning things about birds and their place in the world. And so, from those experiences, I then moved on to my own scientific career, which I was really launched by uh, a Thomas J. Watson fellowship that I won uh, after graduating from Carleton College, where I knew Sarah and Eric Brooks, whom you all know as well. 
And uh, what that fellowship allowed me to do was to follow this bird, the Hudsonian godwit, on their uh, migratory journey from Arctic, Alaska, and Canada to the very southern tip of South America. And I set out with the sort of petty question of trying to figure out why it was that nobody really saw godwits between those places, between Alaska, Canada, and then the southern tip of South America. And I thought as a 22 year old that by hitchhiking and taking uh, uh, overnight buses across vast distances, I might be able to run into godwits in places where no one else had before. And so I wound my way, and if you can see all of the little red arrows there along the coastline and in the middle of the continent, I stopped in a whole lot of places and did learn a lot of things about godwits, although, to be honest, I didn't actually explain the mystery of their migratory route uh, quite in the way I had hoped during that time period. But I gained an immense appreciation for the continent of South, uh, South America. And so I then came back to the United States after that year away and tried to dabble in my other sort of obsession, which is running and moved to Eugene, Oregon, Tracktown, USA, where I hoped to become a professional marathoner. Uh, but that fizzled pretty quickly. And instead, I went back to biology and luckily was able to work with amazing folks like those pictured here, um, Bob Gill and Nils Warnock, who are sort of uh, some of the, the premier uh, migratory ecologists of the past 20 or 30 years. And under their mentorship, I was then able to sort of renew my obsession with Hudsonian Godwits and travel on to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology at Cornell University, where I, I did my PhD on uh, Hudsonian Godwit migration. And what I in fact found was that the reason that people weren't seeing Godwits in between the Arctic and Southern South America is because they largely were flying nonstop in between those places. So all of my hitchhiking was really never going to amount to anything because the birds just simply weren't there. They were instead flying overhead. And the place though that the real sort of, I would say the epicenter of the Godwood world is, is this island, Chiloé Island, which is in Southern Chile. And during my PhD, it's a place that I spent a lot of time. And what's on Chiloé are really uh, huge and rich intertidal mudflats that are the chosen sort of uh, foraging areas of godwits, as you can see in that lower picture there, which is a flock of about 10,000 birds, uh, 10,000 godwits, I should say, that was flying across uh, one of these bays at high tide. And so during my PhD, I went back to Chiloé every year to study godwits. And while I was there, my gaze sort of eventually went upwards in the sky past the altitude that godwits would fly at and up to the mountains that uh, lined the uh, Chilean mainland just uh, off uh, or just sort of over the inlet from Chiloé Island. And eventually I, had to actually start climbing up those mountains and seeing what I could find near their tops. Because the Andes Mountains are really the dominant feature of Chile besides its coastline. And so it would seem remiss to have spent so much time in the country without ever having been to the mountains. And I was lucky enough on one of my first forays to be invited up to um, a valley called Valle El Yeso which is at about uh, 14,000 feet or so, uh, just east of Santiago, the capital of Chile and central Chile, as you can see there in the map on the left. And the Valle El Yeso is a tremendously beautiful area where two good friends of mine, Fernando Diaz and Jim Johnson, were doing some research. And so they invited me up and I took their invitation and got to see some of these mountain birds like gray-breasted seat snipe, and gray hooded Sierra finches, which are sort of the, the juncos or white crowned sparrows of the Andes of Chile. Cool, totally unique birds like the mustached turca. And maybe my favorite, the diademed sandpiper plover, which was actually the bird, the species that, that Fania and Jim were studying. And on their, uh, on their crew, I was able to 
both band some adults like the one on the left that you can see there has little colored bands on its legs and also find some of their really gangly uh, little chicks like you see on the right. After that first taste of the Chilean mountains, I, I realized that I hadn't had enough. And so I ventured further northward to the Salares or the saline lakes of Northern Chile in the Altiplano. And these are incredibly austere, beautiful landscapes uh, that are also tremendously dry. So these saline lakes, just like in the Great Basin of the Western US, form in areas where water can't make its way to the ocean and instead just will sit in sort of uh, basins that uh, collect that water until it evaporates and thereafter start collecting minerals and water. And these salares are home to a really incredible variety of birds given their austerity. So there are things like lesser rias, huge flightless birds, beautiful Andean avocets, sister species to the American avocet that you might see in uh, Eastern Washington. And things like flamingos when they're not being photobombed by alpaca. And these flamingos were what particularly drew my attention because of course they're huge, they're pink, and the uh, Altiplano of the Chilean Andes actually has the highest diversity of flamingos of anywhere in the world with three species uh, spending much of their year up at these really high elevation salares. And those are the Andean flamingo, James's flamingo, and the Chilean flamingo. And two of these three species are endemic to this area, so that means that they breed nowhere else in the world. And those are the Andean and the James's flamingos. And those two species are also highly threatened. So the IUCN uh, recognizes that the Andean flamingo is uh, vulnerable and the James's flamingo is threatened. So that endemism means that, you know, their populations are really regulated by what goes on there in those salares. And thus also, unfortunately, that their populations just aren't that big to begin with. And this is something to really keep in mind because if we look at what's happening across the globe, it's sort of mirrored in what's happening even in quote unquote remote parts of the world like the Altiplano of the Northern Chilean Andes. So the Atacama Desert is one part of that uh, region. You've probably heard of it, the driest place on earth, but even at its elevations, even at its uh, driest uh, extent, it also has an increase in human population. And so since 1980, its population has more than tripled. And even though we're, if you look here at the, the labels on the graph, we're talking about uh, an increase from fewer than 4,000 people to 12,000 people over the, that 40 year period, that's still a tremendous pressure that is now being put on such a dry region. What is driving that population growth? Well, by and large, it's an increasing global demand for the uh, mineral called lithium. Why lithium? Well, you've probably heard of lithium ion batteries, especially if you are a fan of Tesla automobiles. So this is 2021 Tesla Model X lithium ion battery. And as things like Tesla's, or in fact, your cell phone or many other electronic sort of devices have become more prevalent in our lives, the demand for lithium has increased incredibly. So if you look here at this graph, you are seeing thousands of tons of lithium that has been mined. And on the x-axis, you see year. And so that blue line is up through 2015, which was when this data was collected, showing already a substantial increase in the number, the amount of lithium that's been mined. But then that red line there on the right shows the projected increase over uh, a period of 10 years ending in 2025. So we see uh, a more than double uh, expected increase in mining pressure for lithium during that 10 year period. And what does lithium mining do? Well, it's by and large centered in this area of Chile and the neighboring areas of Bolivia and Argentina. In fact, this region is now called the Lithium Triangle of South America. 
And more than 50% of the world's lithium comes from these three countries. And lithium mining leads to uh, a change in the landscape from what you see pictured up there, which is a classic uh, sort of salar from, from this region into something that looks like this, where you have various ponds that are used to concentrate uh, the minerals, and then finally to uh, get rid of waste minerals that are left over after the lithium is actually removed. So it's a really complete transformation of the landscape. And most importantly, maybe a really heavy use of water. So why is that a problem above and beyond maybe the change of the landscape itself? Well, for that, I wanna take a little detour and talk to you about salt. So obviously a saline lake suggests to you that these are salty lakes, they're not fresh water. And salt poses some challenges for living organisms. If we look at uh, here on the y-axis, that vertical axis, the percent salinity, and then we think about um, how much salt water can actually take before it just becomes salt in and of itself. Well, salt begins to saturate out of water at somewhere around 28% salinity. But no organism can actually take in water that's at that kind of level of salinity. And instead, most organisms have a tolerance threshold that sits between about 2.5% salinity on the low end and 15% salinity on the high end. I should say most organisms, these are organisms that actually adapted to things like saline lakes. Okay, so they have those tolerance thresholds, but then really optimal, the, play, the sort of range of salinities that they want to exist at are far narrower and, and exist between about 7.5% salinity and 2.5% salinity. And even at that, salt is a, an energetically costly thing for most organisms to have to deal with, even those that are actually adapted to these saline environments. So seabirds, for instance, that nest out on oceanic islands like albatrosses and petrels are known as tube noses because they have salt glands that are then connected by a salt gland duct through their nostrils so that they can expel extra salt out of their noses. But those are just seabirds and most other birds don't have those. And for those species that don't like this Dunlin, a small uh, shorebird or sandpiper that nonetheless can use saline habitats, we see that when they are using those habitats, the amount of energy they have to expend just to maintain their normal body functions here called mass corrected BMR or mass corrected basal metabolic rate, we see that their uh, BMR increases substantially when they're in salt water or even in brackish water in comparison to what it would be in fresh water. So processing salt is just an ener energetically costly activity for any organism that you're gonna find. And so if we then for a minute, think about the Great Basin, which isn't too far from where you all live in, in Washington, and the saline lakes that are found within it. I want to tell you a little story about what happens when water starts to decline and levels of salinity start to increase. So saline lakes dot the Great Basin, and one in particular, Lake Abert in eastern Oregon, is a place where uh, citizen scientists have been monitoring shorebird and other water birds uh, for over a, a few decades now. And during the time that they've been monitoring water bird populations at Lake Abert, water levels in the lake have strongly declined because of changes in snowpack over warming winters and also use for agricultural and other anthropogenic water sources. And what we found though is that as water changes, so does salinity. And as salinity changes, so do the insects and the birds that live in places like Lake Aber. So this picture on the left is a California gull eating this incredible emergence of brine flies that uh, can be found at Lake Aber at certain times of the year and at certain salinities. So I wanna walk you through the graphs on the right. 
What we have on the vertical axis of both of those graphs are estimates of the abundance or relative abundance, I should say, of both of those species. In the bottom, the gull abundance, and at the top, the brine fly abundance. And on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, we have lake area, which can be thought of as a proxy for salinity. And so for both species, we see that at really low lake areas or really high salinities, their ability to use the lake is basically negligible. There are none around. And as salinity drops and lake area increases, we see that both of them, their populations uh, increase as well, up until a point actually, after which it becomes, the lake becomes too freshwater heavy and neither of them seem to care for the place. So these saline lakes actually have this really narrow window where they can provide uh, 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 appropriate habitat for these saline lake adapted uh, species. And so over time, what we've seen at Lake Abert is that as lake levels have dropped, they have led to 68% decline in six waterbird species that the citizen scientists um, have been monitoring there at Lake Abert. So Wilson's phalaropes, Western sandpipers, Northern shovelers, American avocets, eared grebes, and California gulls. All of them have really low population sizes, or I should say really low ability to use the lake when it's too small and too saline heavy. Okay, so that's about salt. Just remember saline lakes, narrow window in which they can be used by saline lake adapted organisms. And as water begins to go away, salinity tends to increase. So you can probably see where this is going when I talk about mining for lithium and using a lot of that water in the middle of the world's driest desert. So let's focus in on that. The Atacama Desert is this area down here towards the bottom in the middle of the map. And it's characterized by one of the largest salares in the world, the Salar de Atacama. Right there, sorry, I should have remembered that arrow. As I said, this is the driest place on earth. So rainfall can fluctuate rather dramatically over time, but I want you to look at the scale of that vertical axis there. That's annual precipitation in millimeters, millimeters. So we're talking really tiny, tiny increments of rain. Nothing like those of you who are living in or from Seattle would experience uh, over the course of even most months. So on average, I think that precipitation uh, is about 22 to 25 millimeters per year in the Atacama Desert. And as lithium production has increased, so too has water usage. So here on the vertical axis uh, on this graph is total mining pond area, which is a proxy for how much lithium is actually being mined in the Atacama. And we have to use this proxy because mining companies are not really in the, the mood to give us all of their data about exactly how much lithium they're taking out of the ground. So this is the best that we can do is to monitor remotely the amount of mining pond area. And we can see though that over the past uh, 35, 40 years, there has been a, an almost exponential increase in the mining pond area within the Atacama. And there's then a really strong relationship between the amount of water that they're pumping out of the ground and the total mining pond area. So that red line shows the uh, sort of average relationship between mining pond area and how much water is actually being used in the mining process. So over time, there's been both an increase in mining pond area and an increase in water usage. And so along with uh, an international team of collaborators, we set out to really try to understand exactly what kind of effects uh, this increase in lithium mining is having on the uh, flamingos and the Salarex ecosystem in the Altiplano and especially in the Atacama. 
And what we did to, to really explore this is we took uh, surveys of flamingos going back to 1985 that had been carried out by citizen scientists uh, along with the Chilean, Bolivian, and Argentine governments. And then we connected that flamingo data with data on flamingo food. So not sure if how familiar you are with flamingos and, and their sort of diet, but by and large, flamingos are like whales. They're filter feeders. And so they're actually eating really small things like brine shrimp larvae, which are shown here on the right, and other uh, sort of uh, small, in some cases, unicellular organisms. So in order to make sense of how much food there might be for flamingos, we're able to use uh, a remote sensing tool called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which measures how much chlorophyll, which is in plants and algae, you can find in uh, bodies of water or in fact on land. And that chlorophyll is found in some of the algae that flamingos eat. And so we're able to take photos from satellites and understand how much food might be available for flamingos at a given point in time. And then we've also used satellite imagery to estimate how much water was actually available and thus what salinities were likely, uh, likely estimated to be at a given point in time. So we could take images taken from satellites from like this one from 1984. We can outline where the water was and then we can compare them with images like this one from 2018 and see how that shift in water has looked. And we can also use that same Im imagery to create the data that I've already shown you about mining pond area, exactly how extensive those mines were. Because you can clearly see here in the middle of this photo, those obviously unnatural sort of uh, squares and rectangles that characterize those mining ponds. And what we found from this process, first of all, is that the amount of water in the Salar de Atacama has declined uh, really uh, dramatically by about 35% just in the past 25 to 30 years. So likely on top of that, salinities have changed as well. Interestingly, if we just look at raw counts of flamingos from the Atacama though, over that same period of time, we don't see any apparent trend in their abundance. And this struck us as pretty odd because it really ran counter to our expectations, but at, uh, at the same level also was at least temporarily heartening. But we didn't exactly trust just looking at those two graphs themselves to think about exactly what kind of relationship there might be between mining water and flamingos. And so we had to set out to hypothesize the kinds of relationships we might expect to see within the broader ecosystem of a slar. So we might imagine, for instance, that precipitation and what's called evapotranspiration, the rate of which water, standing water, is uh, evaporated into the atmosphere, we might imagine that those two processes will influence, for instance, how much water there is in a salar at a moment in time. We might also imagine, though, that precipitation would have an influence on flamingo food because we know that when there's more water, there's less salinity, and that might be good for flamingo food. We might also, though, then imagine that there's a relationship between mining area and flamingo abundance because we know that flamingos are uh, susceptible to the effects of direct disturbance. So when there are people in the area or loud noises, they're not likely to be around. And then we might also imagine that there are more complex relationships among these. And this can all sort of appear dizzying, but we were able to put this in the, these hypothesized relationships into what's called a structural equation model. And to cut the story short, what that model showed us was that we could identify two sort of lines of effects. Those that were blue were a positive effect, meaning that as one thing went up, the other thing went up too. So when there was more precipitation, there was not surprisingly more surface water area. And when there was more surface water area, there was more flamingo food. But you also see those red colors and those are negative effects. And the one I want you to focus on is 
the mining area, which, as we had initially hypothesized, does appear to have a negative effect both on surface water area and flamingo abundance. So as mining has increased in its area in the Atacama, surface water and flamingo abundance have gone down. And so, in fact, if we look at the number of flamingos and their abundance relative to something I'm going to call scaled mining pond area, we see that uh, for every increase in mining pond area, we get about a 25% decline in flamingo abundance. And so over the past 30 years, there's actually been about a 55% decline in Andean flamingo numbers within the Atacama, largely as a result of increases in lithium mining. So that really calls into question the future of flamingos in the Atacama, because this is a photo from just last year of what that Solara looks like. And the Chilean government has recognized that this is a huge influx of cash into the region and thus has uh, said, go right ahead and keep mining in the Atacama. This is the direction that we want to go. So, that led us to ask, are flamingos in fact doomed? And to answer that question, we then took a similar approach with the data that had been collected, but then looked not only at the Atacama right here in the south, but also at five other Salares, Husa, Antara, Huasco, and Surire in the north. And we again created these hypothesized relationships among all of these factors without including lithium mining because at the moment, lithium mining is actually only occurring in the Atacama. So we were able to ask, well, how many humans are living near these Solares? Did that have an effect? But we were able to remove the effect of lithium mining and look at these relationships. And we found that they were largely similar to those we had seen in the Atacama, minus the effect of lithium mining, with surface water area increasing flamingo food and flamingo food increasing flamingo abundance. So food and water are the key factors for flamingos, no matter where you look across northern Chile. And just to show you that one other way, uh, as food becomes more abundant, so do flamingos. So the number of flamingos that we counted is on the left, uh, sorry, on the, the vertical axis. And our measure of flamingo food is on that horizontal axis. So for all three flamingo species, we found a really strong relationship between food and their abundance. Nonetheless though, because food and water are the drivers of flamingo abundance, as those two things fluctuate, so do flamingos. And so we found that across this whole region, flamingo numbers change really dramatically from year to year. So one year, they could be almost zero, like in 2005, whereas just a few years later in 2012, they could be at their peak of almost 70,000 individuals. And so that's, uh, in some ways reassuring because what it tells us is that flamingos can and do move among all of these salares, meaning that as bad as things get in the Atacama, they might be able to move to other salares to avoid uh, that area when water is particularly low and disturbance particularly bad. So just to summarize then, across this region of northern Chile, we're seeing that flamingo populations fluctuate dramatically, but are generally stable. And that water and food availability appear to be the main factors that influence where in the region they are and how many of them there are at any one time. And interestingly, that all three of the species seem to respond to these environmental changes similarly. But again, in the Atacama, lithium mining is negatively affecting flamingo abundance. So even at, though at the regional scale, we're seeing that flamingo populations are stable, at the local scale in the Atacama, flamingos are declining. So looking forward then, what does this mean? Well, it means, first of all, that lithium production is 
projected to triple in the Atacama in the next decade. As I said, the Chilean government has said full speed ahead with lithium mining there. We know from our work though in the Great Basin that we might see a tipping point where even with those uh, sort of general fluctuations in water and population size that we saw moving between the different salares, that at some point in the Atacama, there's likely to be uh, a tipping point when flamingos are no longer able to use that area because there's too little water, too high salinity. And thus, the combination of future climatic changes and mining may prove difficult for flamingos in the region. And then the take home message that I really want to leave you with is that at large scales of production, few technologies are really sustainable. So we need to think about the fact that yes, Tesla's and other electronic electric drive vehicles have lower emissions and may be really good for the environment in some respects, but they nonetheless are going to have negative consequences wherever the resources that are necessary for their production are actually being uh, taken out of the ground or in other ways taken from the environment. And so our decisions are always going to be complex and rarely is there going to be a silver bullet that will help us to solve some of the global environmental problems that we've created for ourselves. And I also want to point out, though, that this is not something that is just uh, about faraway places like the Atacama and the Altiplano of Chile, because the Great Basin has many of the world's saline lakes. And it not surprisingly then has large reserves of lithium as well. And so there are currently planned mine, planned lithium mines close to a number of Great Basin saline lakes. And that's potentially a problem because even though Great Basin precipitation is uh, projected to increase here with these green colors suggesting larger increases in precipitation over the coming century, snowpack in the mountains surrounding the Great Basin, whether it's the Cascades, the Sierra Nevadas, the Northern and Southern Rockies, or the White Mountains is projected to decline. And it's snowpack that actually really determines how much water can be found in saline lakes in the Great Basin or really anywhere in the world uh, from year to year. And in particular, I want to, to draw your attention to that lowest graph there, the White Mountains in Southern California that may provide water to some of the most important saline lakes. And snow is projected to completely disappear from the White Mountains by about 2060. So we need to think carefully about how much lithium we want to be mining in a place where there's very little water and the ecosystems have a very narrow window in which they're able to remain viable for the species that rely on them. And with that, I just wanna thank the East Cascades Audubon Society and Bureau of Land Management land management who carried out all of those water bird surveys at Lake Abert over the years. And then the many observers who carried out the flamingo surveys in the Altiplano of Chile, especially Nelson Ricardo Amado, who works for the Chilean uh, government, governmental agency CONAF, uh, who provided us with all of that flamingo survey data. And then finally, just on a bit more lighthearted note, because I shared an embarrassing photo of myself from my early years, I wanted to ask uh, maybe the most important scientific question, which was who was cuter as a little kid, Daniel or myself? I'll just leave that there for a minute as we end this. And I'm happy to take questions and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Nate. And uh, thank you for that amazing photograph. I don't think I've seen that one before. So that's new to me. Um, we did my little trove, you know. I mean your shrine. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, we did have a question from the chat here um, from Mr. Wakeler. Uh, are the other Solares also potential mining sites? Yes. Um, the Chilean government has recognized that one of them, Huasco, is uh, 
is a site that they will protect. Uh, they identify as one of the 40 most important wetlands in uh, the entire country of Chile. So that one is set aside and will not be mined. The others, though, are uh, potentially up for grabs. Um, and I'm not entirely clear on the dynamics of what has kept them from being mined just yet, but it's certainly in discussion. And importantly, though, um, if I can actually take you all back, sorry. Um, if you can see this big salar in central Bolivia, Uyuyi, uh, they just started mining there. And that's presumably one of the places that flamingos go when their numbers drop really low in the Altiplano of Chile uh, in those years when there's not much water. So the fact that that has now sort of potentially been taken off the table because of lithium mining is, is likely a real blow to sort of the, the structure of this system as, as we've been seeing it in the past few decades. Another question in the chat here, um, is most of the water used in mining surface or groundwater? Does bringing more groundwater to the surface change the salinity? Yeah, so it is largely groundwater and groundwater tends to be what uh, also populates the saline lakes or the salares. So yeah, they are both sort of directly stealing from the salaris in, in the short term where you know that water is not rising to the surface and becoming part of the salar itself but also groundwater takes much much longer to recharge than surface water does so precipitation and snowfall moves into that groundwater sort of reservoir quite slowly and so the fact that so much of it has been being pumped out is uh, also stealing i would say from the future of the salaris and uh, do you know of impacts on other species um, besides flamingos? Yeah, so there, um, there has been noticeable changes in the vegetation structure surrounding the Saladas in, in the Atacama. And in fact, it's had uh, impacts on the agriculture of the area because one of the really sort of complex and um, unfortunate sort of economic dynamics is that many of the people who are benefiting from the lithium mining are not the people who traditionally lived in the Salar de Atacama. And so those folks were by and large uh, subsisting on agriculture and, you know, other sort of local scale economic practices. And agriculture has been negatively affected by that sort of re groundwater reduction. And so uh, there's becoming this real disparity between people who are making money off of the mining and, and really everyone else. And Nate, how long are these sites viable for lithium mining? That I really don't know the answer to. My, you know, the, my understanding from the literature about the Chilean government's outlook on how, you know, fast they want to move forward with sort of production is that they're not, they're not especially concerned that these reserves are gonna run out anytime soon, but I have not seen any estimates of how long they're gonna be viable. Um, do you know um, what the projections are for precipitation in the Andean Solaris over the next century? Yeah, so precipitation itself, sort of like in the Great Basin is not projected to decline, but like in the Great Basin, snowpack is projected to decline. And uh, so what's going to happen is more and more precipitation is going to fall as rain as opposed to snow. And just like with groundwater being taken out, when snow is taken out of the equation, you know, the water just moves through the system that much more rapidly. And so evapotranspiration, that process of water going, rising up into the air column is expected to, to really increase. So there's not a great outlook for, uh, for the Solaris on that front either. And what elevation are we looking at? Yeah, so there's sort of an elevation gradient from north to south here. So, so Sorire in the north is at um, 4,600 meters, which is somewhere around 14,800 feet or so. And I think the Atacama, we're talking about 12,500 feet. So quite, quite high elevation. 
um, do the Wilson fowler ropes that can be found in uh, Eastern Washington migrate to the Solaris in South America? They do, yes. <laughs> this is where many of them go. And in fact, um, yeah, there are quite high counts from, from these areas, but if you look just to the right under the, the name Argentina, you see an, another uh, couple of Solaris there and they have absolutely uh, huge concentrations of Wilson's fowler ropes. And another question here, um, increasing use of lithium does seem to be our fate. Um, a major mine uh, seems to be near approval in the, the arid area in Northern Nevada, South of Steens Mountain, Oregon. Um, are you familiar with this? And if so, do you have any comments on it? Well, I, I do agree with the sentiment that this is likely our fate, um, but it doesn't mean I, I like it any more than, um, than I like any uh, the thought of, of the destruction of any other area. And, and so nothing that we've seen suggests to me that we can produce lithium at a scale that is sustainable for local scale environments. Um, and given the water bird populations that do rely on Great Basin wetlands, I think that is likely to have some very negative repercussions for, for some species that people um, you know, are, are really familiar with and, and, and have large proportions of their population there in the Great Basin. So um, yeah, it's a, it is a, a naughty question. And besides all of us deciding to walk to work and walk everywhere else we go for the remainder of our days, I'm, I'm not sure how to solve it. Nate, um, are there organizations or efforts um, kind of in that Andes region um, that are working on conservation of these Solares uh, that people can look up and learn more about and support? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, one that I would start out with that's been really uh, instrumental in, in doing a lot of the bird uh, surveys is called um, the ROC, the Red de Observadores de Aves Chile. And I think if you start out looking up them, they will have a list of their partners that might be more on the, the socioeconomic side as well. Cool. Um, and there's a comment here in the chat box, not a question. Um, and uh, Sego says, uh, one thing that we can do here in Washington state is to pass legislation requiring uh, lithium batteries to be fully recycled and paid for by producers of those batteries, um, so-called producer responsibility. Uh, such legislation was introduced two years ago in Washington and uh, will likely be back in 2022 and needs support. So that's definitely something that everybody uh, should pay attention to. And thank you for bringing that uh, to my attention and I'll try and do what I can to elevate uh, that legislation. Absolutely, that, that's really great to hear. And, and you know, that, that reminds me that I actually have a friend who has been working in California along uh, in the sort of electric vehicle community. And, and he said that, you know, folks at places like Tesla and Apple are absolutely aware of the issues surrounding lithium, how that really uh, moves into the calculus of, you know, their technology. I, I don't know, but um, he did say that they do have people that are working on making you know, the battery is longer lasting and or being more easily recyclable. So, so it is something that we can tackle from sort of many different directions. But um, yeah, this is uh, supporting that legislation sounds like a really good short term uh, approach. Yeah, definitely sounds like we should all just be more aware of this issue and look for opportunities in the future. Yeah. Um, Nate, final question here. Uh, you mentioned Godwit's uh, earlier in the presentation. What uh, what Godwit work are you working on right now? What Godwit work? So 
water is becoming a theme in my, my uh, research program. And so the really exciting stuff that, that we're doing is looking at how Godwits also use uh, water during their epic migrations. And we found that they are stopping in really small ephemeral wetlands. So sort of like saline lakes, water that pops up in places where you wouldn't expect it to, and is thus sort of hard to conserve. And so we're really looking into how Godwits make, how Godwits find that kind of water, how they make use of it, and how we might be able to work uh, hand in hand with, with farmers and other landowners to, to uh, conserve those ephemeral wetlands. Awesome. Sounds like uh, some of the work that land trusts could help with. Absolutely. I'd like to think so. So if you want to start in the Dakotas, let me know. <laughs> okay. Awesome, Nate. Uh, thanks for being so generous uh, with your time and answering people's questions. I know it's a lot later where you are than where we are. Um, if folks have any future questions, you can always send them to my email, daniel at medhowconservancy.org, and I will pass them on to Nate and we will do our best to get them answered. Um, I also just wanna mention that uh, we are in the middle of our rural changes in the Medhow Valley course. Um, we have two more sessions to go and they're gonna be really good sessions. Next Monday, uh, we will hear from Scott Ficken, Kristen Kirkby, Susan Pritchard, and Travis Thornton about the current state of our fish, wildlife, wildfire and water. So if you would like to be a part of that course, you can still join. Just email me again at daniel at medhowconservancy.org. Good night, everybody. Thank you all very much.